the Renaissance. We spoke, we've spoken about the Renaissance for a while. I do maintain that it is, uh, it has begun in Florence, Italy, with Dante crawling up out of hell and confronting the stars and trying to make sense of it. Um, and from that seed, buried in a loamy medievalism, from that seed you get the flowering that is the Renaissance. Renaissance meaning, of course, rebirth, rebirth of classical values. Don't dwell too much on that because the Renaissance in general refers to a whole lot of stuff that we don't need to go into or that we can't go into. For our purposes, we consider the Renaissance about the celebration and fascination with man, humankind, people. People are suddenly worth considering. People are suddenly a universe unto themselves. Not just, you know, distant little bugs considering God in all his majesty and infinite wisdom and complexity. Suddenly, like the painting on the Sistine Chapel, God and man are almost equals. Um, and with that comes a great deal of introspection, something that you can find traces of throughout the history of civilization, but that really becomes a central focus with the Renaissance. Um, you don't see Odysseus, for example, buried in his own thoughts as often as you see Hamlet. Odysseus had very complicated thoughts, polytropos, always thinking. But he didn't get lost in them. He knew how to use them to very explicit ends. The problem with once you start considering the mysteries within the human soul, the human mind, the human sense of identity, once you start down that path, it's very, very easy to get lost. Because Human beings are complex. We can't avoid it. We can get lost in our own thoughts. And this is the problem of the Renaissance. Um, a couple of things. October 31st, 1517. Was not an early Halloween. That is the day Martin Luther, a erstwhile Catholic monk, uh, takes a walk to his church in Wittenberg, Germany, and nails 95 theses to the door. Uh, it's a very dramatic move. Basically, he wrote a letter or an essay, a series of complaints, essentially, to the church and wanted to lodge them into the public disgust. It is, in a sense, you know, uh, going in the comment section of the uh, Vatican.org or whatever it is. He had some objections to things the Catholic Church were doing, most explicitly the sale of indulgences whereby certain people 
if they paid some money, they could get the express line to heaven and not have to worry about, well, you know, you've done some shady things in the past. You might have to spend a little time in purgatory. Oh, you're going to make a donation to the church? Well, for that, we can, of course, give you this little get out of purgatory free card. Luther objected to that, and he began this great debate that led to the splintering of the Catholic Church. Christianity now has several denominations, as they are called. And Lutherism, Lutheranism, is the one that began with him on that day. Now, that's fine, you know, it's good to know. But for our purposes, let's just think about what that means. Luther had the uh, nerve to question the biggest institution in Europe, the Catholic Church, to throw a little doubt onto the way they do things, onto the view of the universe that they propagate. That takes guts. Um, but by by voicing hostility to the institution of the church, he was still very much a Christian. He was simply saying that the church itself, as an institution, had become corrupt. But the truth of Christianity as found in the Bible was beyond reproach. So he said that ignore the Catholic Church. Doesn't matter what they say. The Pope himself is evil. It's not an original thought. Think of what Dante did to certain popes. Um, and at the time, you know, they had a good argument. Popes were not always nice guys. But, ignore the church, read the Bible on your own. What does that do? It kind of separates the church from the people. It separates the church from the people. Who is in charge of determining what faith is at that point? People. The people. And not just the people in mass, but within that? People in power. Individuals. Not necessarily people in power. The crux of Lutheranism is that if you have your Bible and you read it, you're good. Don't have to do anything after that. They call that solo scriptura. Nice little Latin phrase meaning only scripture. That's all you need. The priest who in times past would stand up in front of everybody on a Sunday morning and tell them what the Bible means is corrupt. So get rid of them. So this day it's What's that? In every religion until this day, that Saudi serve people or church members or priests, they try to change. Sure, they're, they're giving a yeah. specific interpretation. Luther's position on this is that you should ignore them entirely. And thus empowering already individuals. But what is the problem with saying the church as an institution is corrupt, don't take it seriously, it's all up to individuals? What could possibly go wrong with that? Yeah, like, it's essentially split up the religion to like many different factions. 
Yeah. And we know that that is a likely outcome because it happened. Lutheranism was just the tip of the iceberg. That first little crack in the facade. And from there, you get massive splintering of the Catholic Church. You get all of the so-called Protestant protesting denominations, each with their own interpretation of scripture and doctrine, each with their own idea of saying, well, they're wrong, we're right. But every group within that is then going to splinter off and say, no, they're wrong too, we're right. And each group gets a little bit smaller. Don't trust the authorities. Don't trust the institutions. It's all up to not just people in general, but you specifically. You have the your own authority to interpret. Is that comforting? If the fate of humanity writ large and your ability to know whether or not you're going to burn in hell for all eternity, if that is just up to what you can figure out reading the Bible, that's a little scary. That's a little unnerving. It, there is something comforting about being told by someone, okay, look, uh, this book is very complicated. I've read it through and through. You don't have to. I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version. I'll bullet point it for you. You do what it says, and when you get done with doing what it says, you know what? You're good. You're going to heaven. you got nothing to worry about. It's nice having that relationship. It's nice being able to trust in something like that. But when you yank that away, it's all up to you. It's all up to you and what you can make out of what is, by anyone's reckoning, a fairly confusing book to read. Not to mention that, as a book, people were reading it now in their own languages. In order to read the original Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, you needed to be an expert. Not that many people were, so they started printing vernacular translations of the Bible. Every time you translate something, however, words get shifted around a little. Yeah, everybody has a different word for the same thing. And it's not always a one-to-one -one relationship. So confusion starts to take hold. Taking advantage of those words. Yeah. So you start getting vastly different interpretations of the same basic ideas. Add to that, we're well into the revolution that became, that came from printing. Gutenberg printed Bibles, mostly. Running them off. Hey, I made this great new invention that makes books. Instead of just having monks sitting there copying very laboriously in handwriting, it takes forever, it's very expensive, and you can't make that many of them. Now we're just going to have this press thing and it's going to run them off and people are going to be able to have their own Bible. They're going to be able to come home at the end of a long day and read it by themselves. Instead of just going and listening to it in church and having somebody tell them what it means. But now you're relying on a guy working in a print shop. Maybe not the most scrupulous print shop. There's not a lot of quality control in this era. So, you know, a word, a comma, an apostrophe, gets misplaced here or there. What's the matter? 
things start to seem questionable in ways that they had never been before. You cannot rely on the Bible. One of the denominations that came about, I would argue, a little shiftier than most. 1534, the Church of England is begun because King Henry VIII of England wanted to get a divorce because his wife would not produce the son he really wanted. He kept getting girls, icky pooey. He wanted a boy! He wants to go throw the rugby ball around with him. I don't know what he wanted. He wanted an heir to carry on the throne. The Pope was being a real hard ass about this divorce thing, saying, No, Henry, you cannot have a divorce. I'm the Pope. I say who can do these things, and you do not meet my criteria. King Henry wanted to know who this guy, the Pope, actually thinks he is. He's way over in Italy. I'm here in England. It's totally different. I should be in charge of my own country. He's telling me what to do? No, no, no. That's not how it works. I decide my own fate on my own land. So you know what? I'm going to start my own church. <laughs> and if you look at the practices of the Church of England, uh, they are remarkably similar to Catholicism in many respects, except that instead of the head of the church being the Pope, the head of the church is the King of England. All Henry did was essentially run off a copy of the rules for the Catholic Church, white out wherever they say Pope, and put in his name. Now, when he did this, it led a lot of people to wonder, do you really mean to do that? What gives you the authority to just start your own church? That seems a brazen thing to do. Henry, being Henry, didn't much care. Pretty soon he was lopping off the heads of all of his wives, kept drilling down, literally, for the, uh, for the male heir he never got, and he ended up with Mary, Queen of Scots, and uh, ultimately Queen Elizabeth the first. But suddenly the legitimacy of the king himself seems a little questionable. You can't trust the church. You can't trust the government. Who can you trust? Point is, in times of great uncertainty, you tend to get great art. When people are comfy and cozy and sleeping well at night, they tend not to think too much. Make them a little uncomfortable, make them question things, make them uncertain, and boy, that's rocket fuel. Case in point. Very famous picture. Anyone care to guess? <laughs> I have a question. What? I was, this is always bothered me. So you always talk about like different ancient stuff has like survived for the period of time. Why is the picture of a lady that looks like just a regular lady worth six hundred and twenty million dollars? It's just never been tested. <laughs> uh I could just push it myself. It's not worth six hundred million dollars. Officer, hold it. Ah! Why? Why? Uh, After everything they went through, they're not. They don't deserve that. Like, so 
Uh, I'm not going to get into the evaluation of it. It's a picture. It is just a picture. And yes, these things are silly. And who the hell is ever going to pay that to, like, you know, I am not going to cut a check so that I can hang this on my wall. First of all, it's not even that big. It's really not. It's a fairly modest size frame. Uh, my brother-in-law and his wife and little daughter went to Paris just uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I got a selfie with him and his little girl, who's around three and very rambunctious, and they're sitting there, and you can see the Mona Lisa in the background. And all I could think of, that kid is like a whirling dervish, and she could just go up and, ah, peanut butter! <laughs> so, you know, my brother-in-law perhaps was being a little uh, carefree in those moments. But anyway, uh, okay. Yes, it is a, well, all right. <laughs> I'm not going to argue the finances of it, and you are absolutely in your right to say thumbs up, thumbs down, eh, thumbs down. What I will point out is just a few of the attributes that perhaps may lead people to say it's worth something. Maybe not $600 million or whatever it is, I don't know. But it's, uh, it's got something going on here. To that end. Hello. Mona Lisa. None of you said the title. You didn't know. <laughs> I think you probably figured it out. Um, this is... What is it? Uh, 1503 to 1506. Just like three years of dotting and stuff. Recent evidence has shown that, you know, he went over it a couple of times. You, if you scraped off all of this stuff, you would see other versions underneath that he just kept painting over. Um, we can see this through some x ray footage. But, couple things. Um, it is. Just a woman sitting there. You know, she seems like a nice lady. You know, I don't know. What? Not so pretty. Not so pretty? <laughs> I'm not going there, but okay, you're entitled to your opinion. What? What is interesting about this picture? Considering its value, it's just like a regular... <laughs> Again, leave the money aside! Okay. It's painted, but it's not like... It's, it's very, like, not pretentious in a sense. Not pretentious? Like, she doesn't have any jewelry. She's not... Yeah, she's not... Blinged out. Jury! Sure. It does seem, yes, there's that thing where, you know, you know, oh, her eyes are moving. No, I'm over here. No, I'm over here. There does seem to be a little something going on where perhaps she is following you. Um, I would say that tends to be people reading into it a little bit more than is intended. It's not a gimmick picture like those things you can buy on the sidewalk where, you know, Depending on as you pass by, you see like a little girl walking across the street, and every as you cross by, she's always in a different position. Cheesy stuff. What I see, it's all about me, of course. What I see is, I don't know what's going on in her head, but damn it, something is. You can sit there and stare at that expression. Is she smiling? It's uncertain. She could be smiling, she could be just in a very pleasant mood, or she could be just sort of putting on a little smile and thinking something really bad. Um, you know, I'm not gonna make any comparisons with certain looks my wife gives me, <laughs> but I look at this face and I see something inscrutable. I don't know what she's thinking. 
but I know she's thinking something. There is something in the composition of this face that just sends chills down my spine. You don't know. There is nothing particularly extraordinary about her outward appearance. The drama is all inside. You can say, well, it's all concentrated on the face, but then, yeah, you stare at the face, and it's just the face. People talk about the background, oh, it's spooky or something, and it doesn't matter. Who the hell cares? You could have Bigfoot getting on a spaceship. It wouldn't matter. It's all about what's going on inside here. And that's the point. It's all about what's going on inside there. It's not about what's outside. You'll never be able to see it and say, well, that's, that expression tells me exactly what's going on there. That expression has a certain positive value that you can put a dollar value on. No. It's, it's a mystery. You don't know what she's thinking, but damn it, you know she's thinking something. And that drags you in. She is so placid, but there's something horrifying in her eyes. She is so gentle. But you know she will kick your ass in a minute. She has no eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fashion choice. Okay, fine. She doesn't have particularly remarkable eyebrows. Maybe she shaves them. I don't know. Maybe it's an alopecia thing. Maybe it's a condition. I'm not going to cast dispersions on something like that. Again, she's not your type. I think we've established this. She'll have to learn to get by without you, sorry. Um, but it's a mystery. And that's the value. What's that? She's a woman. She is. But you know what she is? <laughs> she's a painter. She's not a woman. She's a painting. Because this image is a painting. There may or may not have been a woman who looked like that. There may or may not have been a model. Doesn't matter. She's a painting. So as you're sitting there and you're looking her in the eyes and you're seeing all that mystery, all of that uncertainty, all of that something. You do have to confront the ultimate reality that she doesn't exist. It's all just an appearance. We're trying to read something into this face that is ultimately just hollow. I'm looking at the width of her face and there's really nothing there. all just an illusion. Technical point Da Vinci brings out that I will just reference briefly. Most, well, I'm not going to say most artists. Da Vinci is doing here something very sophisticated in a way that was different from much of his contemporaries, many of his contemporaries. Uh, it's not uncommon when you're dealing with painters that they would perhaps sketch an early version and then paint it in, or perhaps take a you know simple black fine tip brush and sketch a rough outline and then paint in between the lines. And it gives a nice clear 
outline to everything that you're looking at. Da Vinci does not do that here. He does something called, and I love this word, sfumato. Italian. Is there anything better than Italian? I'm sorry. Italian is like ice cream with bourbon. It's perfect. Sfumato is a blurring of tones. Sfumo, like smoke. So as you look at all of the differences, all of the lines you think you're seeing up there, they're not really lines. They're not that clear to see. He is blurring every edge, which has a nice mysterious quality as you look at it. It's like, oh, it's very soft, you know? Sometimes when the focus is too sharp, it's, you know, not that attractive. But, you know, if you can be just a little gazy, a little hazy, Everybody looks better on cloudy days than on sunny days. Look at your photos. But he is also very literally blurring lines, blurring distinctions. The line between the face and the hair is a very uncertain gradation of shading. It's hard to really get a handle on that. It's hard to really know where you stand. Where does her face begin? Where does her hair begin? I don't know. Sfumato. S F U M A T O. Italian. It's a mystery. A couple other quick highlights. Um, Caravaggio. Boom! This is jumping over Caravaggio is most famous, but 1601. He paints. He's a uh, very well-known painter today. He was actually fairly. He was. He was recognized as great in his time as well. This is a portrait uh, he calls, this is the incredulity of St. Thomas. Hello. If you read, what is that? I think it's, no, I don't have it here. One of the Gospels. I don't remember which one. I'm thinking maybe Luke, but I could be wrong about that. At one point, uh, Christ comes back from the dead. He's down off the cross. He's dead, and he's walking around. And he meets some of his old pals, and of them, Thomas says, how do I know you're really Christ? And this is where we get the phrase that is still existing today, a doubting Thomas. Somebody who's just skeptical about things. And you get this very visceral picture of Thomas poking his finger in the hole that Christ received in his chest, just under the rib cage, when he was up on the cross, the Roman soldiers were slashing at him or something, or stabbing him. Because, you know, if you got somebody suffering in horrible pain, you want to make it worse. But look at this. This isn't just... I am Christ, Son of God, you must worship me. This is an ordinary man, Thomas, saying, yeah, I don't know about that. Let me see. Uh, yeah, it's really pretty gruesome. But why does Caravaggio single out this moment he painted a lot of very famous moments. Well, why is he signal out, single out this moment here as something to really capture? And again, he makes this visceral. You can see little folds of flesh as he's peeling up the skin to go poking around in what is probably, I'm guessing, I don't know, the liver? I don't know, where's the liver? Why this?
I will point out as well. I think he's blind. What? He's blind. Blind? He does kind of look a little like, you know, he's having trouble seeing. Maybe a little <laughs> something going on. I would say he's just at that moment of realization like, hey, wait a minute, this is the Son of God, and I've got my finger in his gut. I think that is starting to dawn on him like, oh, damn. <laughs> I should have taken his word for it. I'm in trouble. Um, perhaps he is blind. I don't know. That was not covered in the gospel, I will say that with some certainty. Um, Thomas, Christ, these guys, all very human. Look at the wrinkles on Thomas's forehead. Very human. These this guy is known, by the way, as St. Thomas, of course. The title is The Incredulity of St. Thomas. These are saints. These are holy, holy men. But they're men, as is Christ, whose skin folds in a very normal way, with the exception of the fact that he's supposed to be dead here, and he's got a finger in his gut, and no goo coming out. Inspection, not taking everything on faith, questioning, doubting, doubting Thomas. Don't take the institution's word for it. Don't take, don't give over your will or your right to think to anybody but yourself. No matter how iconic an example, no matter how a authoritative an institution. Don't surrender your freedom to doubt. Shakespeare! Shakespeare is a fun guy. One of my personal faves. Um, <sighs> grew up uh, pretty much nobody. We know very little about him as a human being. I prefer it that way. It's very easy when you are studying literature to get lost in biography and start saying, oh, well, you know, this, this clearly shows that he was mad about this, that, and the other thing. At times, that is valid. I personally do think that Dante is a lot of fun to read when you read him as somebody who's just really mad at everybody who kicked him out of Florence and he's writing this great thing so he can throw all of his enemies into hell. Um, that's a fun way to read it. But we don't know that much about Shakespeare. He was nobody. Dante was a relatively impoverished nobleman in Italy. He was a person of some importance. Uh, Shakespeare? No. He was nobody. But he made himself extraordinary. When you strip away institutions, when you, let's say, level the playing field, some remarkable things can happen. And Shakespeare is the greatest example of that. He had nothing but his own genius. And it is astounding. Now! This is one of his most famous poems. Shakespeare did not, in fact, think of himself, or tried not to think of himself as a playwright. He wanted to be a poet. Poets are artists. They're noble, you know? There's a long tradition of poets being associated with royalty, with dignity, with the higher callings in life. He viewed 
playwriting as a way to make a buck. At times, you almost get the sense, and you see like when he's switching registers from playwriting to poetry. He felt cheap in the theater. He made a lot of money there. Obviously, this is how we know most of his work. This is what we associate with him, but especially at the time, it really wasn't that dignified. Common people went to the theater. Poetry was for the elite. Now, this one is him sort of doing what Kelly and I were talking about a little bit before with uh, Andre Asimov, the novelist, about how he always sort of keeps himself a little bit apart. He can never really join in anything whole hog. He's always straddling two worlds and, you know, keeping an eye on both of them, judging them. Shakespeare very much wanted to be part of the noble, romantic, uh, little r romantic, renaissance tradition of poetry. Like most renaissance artworks, renaissance poetry began in Italy. Um, you start to get these figures of women as these divine beings that need to be worshipped as perfect. We see some of this in Don Quixote, when he's going on and on and on about Dulcinea. And Dulcinea is just really a figment of his imagination. The great lady who is perfect and noble and beautiful and refined. There's a long tradition of that in poetry, in the history of poetry, that as you read it, starts to sound, oh, I don't know, a little fake, a little rosy colored, a little idealistic. So then you see the other Shakespeare reacting against that, saying, I don't know about that. I can sing that song, but I'm going to be a little ironic about it, you know? So instead of celebrating the perfection of his beauty, my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Nothing! Goes almost without saying that saying that you're the one true love of your life that her eyes were like sparkling like suns or stars or diamonds or whatever they are. He's saying, no! Nope! Get that out of your head. Coral is far more red than her lips red. Another popular cliche of the time. Taking a cliche, whipping it around until it's fresh again. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. Don't need to know what that word means to know that it ain't necessarily flattering. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. Guys, Valentine's Day is coming up. <laughs> Jot this down. Let me know what the reaction is. <laughs> I have seen roses damasked, red and white, but no such roses I see in her cheeks. And then it gets downright nasty. And in some perfumes, there is more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. Man. This takes guts. Uh, 
I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. Ah. I grant I never saw a goddess go, my mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet by heaven I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. So he sets up this whole, essentially, comedic rant about, you know, what a kind of homely, stinky broad he's actually hanging out with. And then at the very end, it doesn't matter. For all of these physical imperfections, what he sees, what he really values, is something beyond that. He doesn't say what it is. We're just left to speculate. Well, what is it? You can't nail it down. Significantly. He spends an awful lot of time talking about what she looks like. Then he gets to what she smells like. Then he gets down to what she sounds like. <laughs> Sight, smell, sound. You can make an argument that black wires growing on her head might be a tactile sensation. I'm not going to go where, you know, the whole taste thing, but we're basically hitting the most of the senses, physical senses. Um, the information we take in through our physical senses tells us an awful lot about the world. When we see this, we see a guy who is taking in information through his physical senses. Wondering, like, you know, I don't understand how this person can be walking around when I saw him dead just the other day. Let's investigate. He sets up the form, the style of a Renaissance sign. It's the form of a poem here. A, B, A, B, whatever, say, uh, who cares? Certain number of lines, certain rhythm, certain rhyme scheme, bada bing, bada boom, bada bang. He's mimicking that. So when people start reading it, they recognize it and say, oh, okay, yeah, he's sort of riffing on this. It's a parody poem. Yeah, I love these. This is, this is, this is a guess. But then at the very end, he spins it around. And by the time you're laughing here, saying, yeah, man, that's great, he jumps away from you. And he says, no, let's think about this. We're not going to laugh at her. She's not an object of ridicule. She is still, ultimately, the object of his love. But again, you don't know why. Why? What is there to love about her? What is there that is so incredible about this person? How can you value her? She's ugly, she stinks, and she sounds horrible. What's the dollar value? How do you appraise this? Inner qualities. The interior. The interior man. Because it's not about the objective world anymore. Now we're talking about what's going on inside. Just like 
Luther said, don't worry about all of that stuff that the Catholic Church tells you to do. What really matters is what's going on inside you. He called it solo fidelis. Doesn't matter what you do in the world, as long as you have faith. Through faith alone you shall be saved. The inner life, the inner value, the inner truth that you can't necessarily see. Again, what is her inner truth? What is her inner life? What is she really thinking about? You don't know. You don't know because it's impossible to penetrate any face. You don't know because this is a painting, not a face. I point out again, this is a painting, not a face. This is a sonnet. He pushes it into a very formal form. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more, far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. Sun done red head. It rhymes. It has a very easy, natural rhythm. Gives the appearance of just being ordinary speech, but it's not. It's very carefully thought out language. Words, not truth. Words. And he admits this. Because he can paint this whole picture of her being kind of disgusting. But then at the end, he turns around and says, yeah, but that has nothing to do with it. Everything that's worthwhile, you can't see. And you have no idea about it. But it's superficial. It's a poem. Again, nothing there, nothing behind it. You think you're seeing something real, you're not. You're seeing art, artifice, something fake. Now, when you see something that is fake, what do you do? Can you trust it? No. You start leaning away from it. You know? Start going, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's not reality. That's just someone's portrait of it. It's faith. You can put all your faith in it and say, yes, this is true. This is true. But maybe it's just language. Maybe it's just words. What does that do to solo scripture? If you have faith in language and take it as the only truth, only the scriptures, only writing, only art. If you have faith in that and you recognize that it's fake, that it's all just words, a game, let's see if I can string people along with this little poem. And then at the very end I'll point out, oh yeah, you have no idea what I'm talking about up here. You just went along with my little game. I'm making you dance on a string. Once again, you see truth is a matter of individual judgment. It's something that you cannot rely on. Anything that asserts to a kind of institutional value 
an ultimate value, order in the universe, all just empty words. canvas that Shakespeare liked to paint them. This is the Globe Theater, or at least a recreation of it, shot through an extraordinarily distorting fisheye lens. Um, the real one burned down several centuries ago, so, you know, the cameras weren't very good then. Uh, but this was rebuilt, and they housed, or they put on performances to this day. I will point out a few things. This is Largely uh, a replica of the one that Shakespeare um, worked in. Uh, you know, a couple things added. Plumbing, electricity, you know. But open sky. People all around jamming in as many people as possible. Why? Because they buy tickets. Shakespeare was the Marvel movie studios of his day. He would grind these things out just to get people in the seats. You can stand down here really cheap. You can sit in some of these for more. Generally, you know, capitalism being what it is, the cheap seats would go to the most common people and, you know, people who were a little bit more wealthy, a little more sophisticated, perhaps even a little aristocratic, while well, they can afford the good seats. Um, what are some of the problems with open-air theaters like that? What? Weather! Weather! You're kind of limited. I go to Shakespeare in the Park with some regularity. I saw Othello there last summer, and I got rained on. I got soaked. There's a line where Othello comes out, grabs Desdemona's hand, and says, Your hand is moist. <laughs> <laughs> and the actor actually broke up and started laughing because she was drenched to the skin already with the rain. And they called it right then, and everybody went in and like had like 45 minutes to wait for the rain to pass. <laughs> You're subject to weather. To compensate for that, London, not good weather, uh, it kind of shortens your season a little. You don't put on plays during the summer or during the winter time. So it tends to be a summertime event. What other natural limitations might you see with an open air theater? What is all of this up here? Daylight. You don't have fancy spotlights. You don't have special effects. You don't have any of that stuff. You have a bare wooden stage. No lights anywhere. All of your performances are going on in the full light of day so that people can see you. Because once the sun sets, they can't. And you're not going to get full price for your tickets. So, only in summertime, when the weather tends to be warm, only in daylight, when it tends to not be dark. Now we'll get into this soon enough, but for realism's sake, 
What do you do if you want to start off a play with some version of, it was a dark and stormy night? How do you represent that? I'm taking a guess. You could have like a narrator, but like you can't see. Say. Yeah, we don't have uh, narrators in Shakespearean scripts. You can read through. You don't get a lot of that. You get some people filling that role, odds and ends here and there, but nobody's saying it was a dark and stormy night. But you're not far off. What you get is characters saying, Burr, it's cold. Or, I can't see anything, it's so dark out. <laughs> now, if you're sitting in the audience and you are sweating like crazy because you're crowded in with all of these people and it's mid-July and it's blazing sunlight out, and you see somebody up there going, Burr is cold in the middle of the night. You have two choices. <laughs> you can just say, what? What are you kidding? I'm sweating my balls off. Or you can say, all right, I'll go with it. Hello. Sorry. You say, all right, I'm just going to buy into it. The old storyteller's thing, the willful suspension of disbelief. You can either walk out and say, well, that makes no sense. Or you can say, all right, I'll go with it. It's the story. Sure, I'll buy it. It's dead of winter, just past midnight. And everybody up there shivering. All right, fine. That's what you got to do. Shakespeare knows he can do this all through what, 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 what's the medium? Words. He can have a character say, brr, it's cold, and immediately he knows you have to believe it's cold. Those words are plainly not the truth. It's just fake. Artifice that we're all going to buy into to go on this little ride. Some of the best Shakespeare comedies are predicated on this little belief that he will then spin out and make fun of right in front of you. And there are a million ways to make fun of that. A couple of years ago, there was a production of Shakespeare in the Park, a all-female cast for the Taming of the Shrew. Taming of the Shrew, for those of you who don't know, is a story about how a guy, or, the, or, well, let's just start with, there's a woman who needs to get married because she is so incorrigible and so difficult. Her, her father basically goes to this new cowboy come to town and says, marry my daughter because, you know, you, you got to take her off my hands and teach her her place. And then the whole comedy, comedy, is about breaking her spirit, if you will, so that she becomes a docile and polite lady of society. Now, that story has not traveled very well through the centuries. Now most people look at it and say, it's a little sexist, a little bit. So Shakespeare in the Park did it with an all-female cast. And what does that do to it? Suddenly you've got all women doing this very sexist play. And it makes you go, hmm, that's curious. And of course, in Shakespeare's time, who was playing the female parts? Men. Women, proper women, were not allowed on the stage the theater could be shut down if they have women on there. It's so unladylike. So, in Shakespeare's time, all the characters were men, half of them being in drag. Boys, usually, but you know. So that suddenly colors that even more. 
And in many productions of Shakespeare, you have the female characters, played by men or boys, the female characters who then dress up in the play as men to pass and go and have conversations with other men pretending to be men. I know I was just in a girl's costume before, but now I'm in a boy's costume, so you're going to accept me as a man and we're going to have a conversation. Whoa, boy, how about those bears? These layers of complication are A, funny, and B, intentional. Because they're pointing out, in case it wasn't excruciatingly honest, they're pointing out that you are watching pretend. It is all fake. It is all just play. Don't take it too seriously. Don't get so riveted that you give yourself over to it entirely. Don't fall into the trap of believing that the fantasy is real. That's what Quixote did, and it didn't work out well for him. You're supposed to straddle that line. Reality, unreality. Appearance and truth. Because you don't know what any of those lines mean. You don't know where those lines fall. You're always uncertain. And when you cannot establish certain values, objective, in life, you fold in on yourself. And you start saying, well, okay, what do I really know? What's... What can I know? If everything out there is confusing, maybe I should just start small. And turn the gaze inward and try and find some interior value that I can feel solid about. And that's where we end up with, with Hamlet. I'm going to get